so hello and welcome. Joining me today is an independent Scrum caretaker, as he loves to refer to himself, Günther Verheim from uh, Belgium, Antwerp. Hi, Günther, and very nice to have you on board. Hi, Bogdan. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to your podcast. It's an uh, honor to be here. First thing I just want to ask you that I have prepped for my questions list is hasn't Scrum become boring over so many years? It seems that you have been doing it uh, almost since the moment you've graduated and started working and it have been multiple decades and you have been almost everywhere and probably any person that works with Scrum have heard your name or read your books. Uh, have you ever considered the switch in the career? Uh, uh, yes, it did happen at some point. Now, first of all, let me start by answering your question. No, I'm not bored with Scrum, not at all even, although that, that might be strange because, you know, we, we like to call Scrum a simple framework. And so uh, that is crucial for Scrum, it's simplicity. Yet, indeed, like you say, I've written a book about it. I've revised my book twice. So the, the, the new, the third edition is, uh, has come out uh, in, 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 in uh, March 2021. So that's so strange, such a simple thing. I still love it. And, and I'm still discovering new ways to, let's say, express Scrum and, and how to work with Scrum. Now that doesn't mean I, I, didn't, I didn't start my career with Scrum because I, I, I graduated as an uh, industrial engineer in electronics a long time ago, back in 1992. And it was in 2003 when I discovered uh, it's all way of working initially through something that's called extreme programming, by the way. And then extreme programming, extreme focus on programming. So a lot of great um, team practices combined with uh, programming or development practices. And, and back in 2003, when he started with extreme programming, later on, we sort of added Scrum to that. In that sense, we wrapped our extreme programming practices in, in, in the Scrum framework. And I never really got bored of it. The, the only time, so that's been, we're now 2021. So that's over 17 years of, of, of Scrum and, and Agile. And, and uh, I like, I still, like the combination of Scrum with extreme programming, by the way, but I'm not bored of it. The only thing that ever happened was another thing had nothing to do with Scrum back in 2007, 2008. So after uh, a number of years of, of working with teams and so on, I switched companies at some point in time and I was sort of seduced by promises of a management position and so on. So for a very short period, I left some things with Scrum behind. But in the end, after, after not too long, you know, uh, the, the management promises were not really, <laughs> really true, it seemed. And then uh, I, I just quickly went back to Scrum. And so that was a choice. So yeah, this is, this is where my heart is. I, I feel I need to go back to Scrum. So that's the only short uh, period of time, which, which in a way wasn't bad because shortly after that, I remember um, by the end of 2009, Ken Schrader, started uh, the organization that we both know as scrum.org for the uh, organization that has professional scrum message brand and that was that was not too long after the after um, me discovering that no scrum is my life it's scrum is what i love to do scrum is scrum is where my heart is so i i, I uh, engaged early on with with scrum.org i followed the first uh, creation of the assessments by by Ken and so on, and then and in 2010 2011 became a professional Scrum trainer, um, and in the meantime, like you said, I've written so what I like to call my own book. It's called Scrum: A Pocket Guide, so it's now a third edition, and uh, last year in 2020, uh, I published a book with uh, O'Reilly, so the uh, publisher in in the United States, which is called 97 Things every Scrum practitioner should know, a collection of essays of people around the world, sort of leading, leading, almost proven practitioners. And when I had to look for uh, authors that wanted to contribute to the 97 Things book, because in the end, you know, 97 articles, that's really a lot. 
I had no idea when I started this, but I, I went um, asking people around the world to contribute and I just made sure that I didn't just go for whatever you would call famous names. I looked for people that had something valuable to say to Scrum. And again, evidence that Scrum is simple. In that sense, it, it, it is a lightweight framework. It only has a limited set of rules, a limited set of instructions. But a limited amount of instructions at the same time creates so much openness, possibilities. It leaves so much room for options and, and in a sense, tune Scrum to your context. That at the same time, there's so much you can write and, and, and describe about Scrum. So 97 things from people around the world, 97 articles, perspectives on Scrum. And, and even I'm, I'm currently working on a new book of Scrum. I've been looking back at my, again, my 17 years of Scrum. You know, a really turning, an important point for me, not really a turning point, but an important point for me, Bogdan was back in 2010, 2011, again, coinciding with, with sort of rediscovering my, my, my love, my passion for Scrum, engaging with Scrum the Talker, uh, start, starting off the path to become a professional Scrum trainer. Around the same time, I, so as you said, I live in Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, around the same time, I uh, was, was pulled, dragged almost, pulled to the Netherlands. Um, where there was a lot of demand for Scrum and I was working for a large consulting organization. They had no idea how to answer that demand. So a lot of things happened in a period, let's say 2010, 2011. And, and as from that point on, I, I worked almost, started working almost full-time in the Netherlands. And what was so great of having done Scrum for seven years by that time, um, and, and let's say just Scrum with different teams in different environments, um, large, smaller organizations, different uh, domains, uh, telecom, um, the e-business, government, um, transportation and stuff. Um, by by having, having that foundation of seven years just Scrum, without any ambitions, without any career ambitions, without wanting to be whatever, because by then the Scrum Alliance already had some sort of career path. I never cared about those things. I was looking back, it wasn't something I planned for, but looking back, back in 2010, 2011, starting to work with really large organizations, like most famous example is probably ING, the, the Dutch bank that I uh, guided um, in the, with their first steps uh, in, in the world of HR with, when it was still just Scrum and not later on Spotify, whatever it turned into. But having just done Scrum for seven years in a, row, in, a, in a row without any ambitions gave me, looking back, an incredibly important and firm foundation upon which I could start engaging with large organizations. So it helped me see that sometimes you need to take time. You know, we, we live in a very, you know, 24 seven real time connected whatever world. Um, it, it, it sometimes feels like we don't take enough time to develop, to grow, to learn, to fall, get back up, improve, and so on. And so in that 17 years of Scrum, that was really a very important moment in time for me, um, becoming a professional Scrum trainer, engaging quite actively with Ken Schwaber, uh, moving over to the Netherlands, working with large organizations, certainly in the financial world like ING, but other banks in the, in the Netherlands, insurance companies, but also companies in the Netherlands like Philips. And, and that, was, that was incredibly important. And it gave me the foundation of keeping it simple always relentlessly promoting the simplicity of Scrum. Because you know how that goes in, in large organizations, right? They, uh, they want to make it big and they think they need all sort of scaling, whatever frameworks. And, they, and they, uh, Scrum is so simple, you, that, that will never be enough. So they start adding things again, roles and titles and phases on top of Scrum. In a way, they, they take away the lightweight character of Scrum by overloading it and overburdening it. Um, but that's sort of important. So by coincidence, seven, 2007, 2008, shortly not leaving, but focusing on different aspects of my career or trying to focus on different aspects of my career, helped me in a way discover or rediscover my love for Scrum. 
it's also the point of time when I started moving to the Netherlands and, and in a way I've always been serious about Scrum. But sort of becoming serious about Scrum um, also helped me to really start writing about Scrum. So in those first seven years of Scrum, I didn't really write a lot about Scrum. So in 2009, I started blogging, I started up my blog. And that, and that in the end culminated into the sort of uh, ended up with uh, me writing that book about Scrum, Scrum, a pocket guide back in 2013 um, with a foreword by Ken Schwemer, by the way, which I still uh, appreciate a lot. And, and again, sometimes things happen. And my, my little book, it's only about 100 pages. It's a very small format. It's really, it's a pocket guide, literally. Something you take along in your pocket and on the train or in the car or on the tram, on the, on the airplane, whatever. And, and then pull it up. And um, that sort of unexpectedly turned into a success. I never planned for it. I, I never had the ambition to write a book also anyhow. Um, so, so a lot of strange things happen in, in our life. And I think, you know, one of the scrum values, openness that has been a really important thing throughout my, let's call it career, right? Between quotes in scrum, openness, keeping an open mind for options, meeting new people, new meeting other people and so on. And, and that was sort of at some point in time, I had the opportunity to write a book, um, and, and I thought, let, let's give it a try. In a sense, I, I did that. It, it ended up being a lot more hard work than I expected and I assumed before that. Because back in 2013, I felt, okay, I've been writing blog notes and different aspects of, well, different aspects of Scrum for two years now. Yeah, I can easily compose a book based upon my uh, writings. Now, that wasn't true. Um, maybe also a bit of a drive for excellence. I wanted the book to be really excellent. Um, but again, sort of sensing options, opportunities, and going for that, I think that is really important. And, and for me, it's a good example of what the value, the scrum value of openness means. Because in a way, you would like teams to do that too. Scrum masters, product owners, scrum teams, to show that openness and, and sense, um, try to sense opportunities and options, things that you want to do. So, and, and, and that has helped me a lot in, in my whatever you would call a career. And then, yeah, really, really great stuff actually looking back. But I'm, to come back to your question, no, I'm not at all bored with Scrum. <laughs> yeah, I guess at this point, if anyone had doubts, uh, now they are convinced that you can be passionate yeah, about that stuff for, for years. Uh, yeah, you, can, you can easily get me started and then I'll have uh, difficulty stopping. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I wanted to ask as well is, have you ever noticed a difference in behavior and patterns and uh, just experience uh, in the generation of Scrum practitioners that are old enough to remember the Agile Manifesto being signed and the new generation that are in their late 20s, uh, early 30s, that were starting their careers uh, when Scrum was already uh, a mainstream in IT world, at least. How, how do you feel about new generation? Is it being better or worse or just different? It's probably, I don't know, but it's really different. Um, but it's a good thing. So, um, what, what, what I noticed, in, thanks to my 17 years, so I've also written about that in my book, you know, I don't know whether you know something about the chasm theory of, of Jeffrey Moore, saying, well, a, a, a new innovative um, product or service or, or paradigm uh, takes some time to, to take off, and it often ends up in something that they call a chasm, a, a period of almost silence that you don't really know what's happening. And, and I believe Agile as, as a movement, a way of, of thinking with uh, Scrum, let's say spearheading uh, the pack. Um, I think there's a general agreement that Agile with Scrum spearheading the pack um, came out of the chasm around 2006, 2007. And for me, that was an, was an important moment in, in, in two ways. First of all, before that, 
let's say when I started with Agile and Scrum 2003 until 2005, 2006, um, it was fascinating because we didn't use the term Scrum. Whatever we were doing, working in sprints, and we had all of the accountabilities and so on, delivering great work products and services using Scrum, <clears throat> but we didn't call it Scrum because nobody knew what it was. Nobody, uh, some people thought it was going to make you ill or so. So we didn't use the term Scrum. We didn't use the term Agile. That started changing around 2005, 2006. Um, and, and also, by coincidence that, that coincided with, with Agile across the world, in a way, crossing the chasm. Um, there's been some, some great case descriptions from around that time on, for instance, Yahoo at large scale adopting Scrum. So Scrum and Agile became accepted words as an indication that they became accepted ways of working. So they were really breaking through. That has caused a lot of things. Now, at that, at that point in time, most practitioners were still like more, it's, it felt like a little bit like more like being pioneering. In that sense, um, that was important in the sense that you didn't have to, in a way, convince people. The people that were applying Scrum and, and uh, as a way of this agile way of working, they just did it out of, out of their own intrinsic motivation. They loved it. They, they, they liked it. They were driven by it. So one of the, one of the, the side effects of, of Scrum and Agile crossing the chasm and becoming like you just rightfully called it mainstream. Now that still took a couple of years at least, it's, it's growth. It's been evolving. But what, one of the effects that you see is that certainly when large organizations start adopting Scrum, that it, it certainly becomes imposed on people. It's not, it's not really been driven by the enthusiasm and the excitement of people discovering it for themselves. It's like they have to do it. Organizations tell them that they have to do it. And I remember <clears throat> one of my biggest, biggest struggles from around that time, let's say 2006 and certainly, certainly in 2007, was uh, working with other teams and other people in other organizations, other products and so on. And I suddenly had to make things very explicit. I had to suddenly explain why working in sprints, why using great development practices like peer programming, and, and for me, like I'm not really truly a tech guy, why use things like a continuous integration, test-driven development, pair programming, why that really works in the context of Scrum, what the accountabilities of Scrum are about, why they are so important. And that was, that was I went through a difficult period around that time, 2007. Why? Because up to that point, we just did it. We got it. It, it made sense to us. And without overthinking all of that, we just went for it. We just did it. And then suddenly with people having to do Scrum because other people told them that they had to do that, um, that, that, was, that was a strange, strange step for me because suddenly you had to make explicit a lot of the things that before that we had been doing almost implicitly, almost intuitively or instinctively even. So that was strange. Now, I'll, I, I, I want to I give one very tangible example of that. That's stuck in my head. So in 2007, I'd been working with a team and we had launched the first version of a certain uh, product that was in, 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 in the world of healthcare, by the way. And, 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 and for whatever reason, a uh, large part of the team uh, was replaced or went away or went to do something else. So we handed over in a way the work to another team, but I was still Scrum Master by times also a bit of product owner or helping the product owner out. And, and after a while of working with the new team on the same system, let's say the next release of the product or the system that we were working on, one of, one of the old team members came back to check in with a couple of things and, and, and work with us. And he, and he then silently afterwards approached me, you know, Gunter, do you know that the team is ruining the test first? So the test driven fix, we were doing test driven, test -driven development, meaning First, create a test, design a test, and then start writing code until the test succeeds. And he said, do you know that they're not, um, that they're not writing tests first anymore? They're not doing, oh my God. So suddenly you have to work with people that call themselves professional developers. And suddenly we have to explain why test-driven development is so important. And that, that, that felt really strange. And that, that's one of the effects. Now, as from 2010, 2011, 
it's sort of what I call the second wave of Scrum. So Scrum was sort of um, sort of in a stealth mode, a dark mode of implementation, um, even the years after the Agile Manifesto. Before that, before the Agile Manifesto, it was totally obscure thing. Um, and after the Agile Manifesto, uh, so Agile became successful, uh, people were seduced, in a way tempted by the, the thinking behind the Agile Manifesto, started doing Scrum. Still pioneering sort of dark stealth mode, we didn't call it Scrum ourselves. As from 2005, 2006, when, when Agile and Scrum crossed the chasm, it's what I call the first wave of Scrum. More like a first reconnaissance wave, people getting to know Scrum. Scrum often introduced as the new IT process, you know, and, and um, in, a, in a way often within organizations used as a new process for IT to deliver quick, quicker to the business. And it's not always in the best interest of end users and so on, sort of the new IT delivery process. And then the next Scrum wave was for me uh, around 2010, 2011. Again, it, it just, for whatever reason, came together with, with, with my personal, um, let's say, evolution, personal professional evolution. But suddenly, large organizations started discovering Scrum. And, you know, Scrum too simple, it can't be that easy, and so on. In a way, sort of driven by the idea, we have to make it more complicated and more difficult and more complex. So second Scrum wave, large organizations um, discovering Scrum. And, 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 and also in that wave, so scaling became a theme of that second Scrum wave. And fascinating enough, a lot of organizations felt like, yeah, you know, Scrum, we know this by now, sort of we are beyond Scrum. So they started giving it different names or using different frameworks or methods, whatever. So I, I remember those times, so after a few years of working with ING, I, I stopped my engagement with ING by the end of 2012. And it was about half a year before they went into the Spotify model and made it extremely popular across the world and certainly across Europe. Um, so suddenly you saw things like Spotify popping up, Safe popping up, or it had to be called DevOps and, and lots of things that we don't even remember because those are the more, more common or more known names. So suddenly... People didn't want to call it Scrum anymore. It was uh, also too simple. Often they made it more complicated, scale and, and giving different names and, and, and sort of different colors and flavors, um, making it heavy again. And, and that, that was sort of strange for me. So, so in my, again, career of 17 years, I went through some um, minor, let's say at least minor ups and downs. So if you look back at sort of, we like, we like to see trend lines right, in the world of agile and iterative income of the world. So for, if I look at my trend line, sort of my, my in a way, burn up chart of, of Scrum, it's, it's sort of steadily going up, but there has been, there have been like a real burn up or burn down chart should be, there have been some ups and downs. And that was a more difficult thing because in, in all of my career, starting in 2003, I had never, uh, let's say used HL or as a sort of brand to sell myself. My, my thing, my tool, my instrument, my, my, my passion, my love is Scrum. It's tangible framework. It helps. It has, I explained the, the roles, the accountabilities, how it works. I can, I can help people see how it makes them more HL, how it helps them increase their agility, but it's not that fluffy, puffy sort of thing that we saw also emerging in those days, let's say that second wave of Scrum, scale large, and suddenly um, this thing called agile coaches popping up all over the place. Um, and, then, and then I was like, oh my God, I never focused or around or emphasized that thing agile, it's just Scrum, a very tangible way, really helpful. So that was also a, a strange sensation by that. So, so minor ups and downs, but in the end, at some point in time, so the, again, those large organizations adopting Scrum, looking for uh, results, improved agility, improved flexibility, better time to market. They, they, they looked for a ways to reconnect with their consumer base, their customers and so on. They were not happy with customer satisfaction of what they're doing. Uh, engagement of their teams wasn't like, not too brilliant and so on. So in a way, a lot of organizations started realizing that um, 
tackling complexity, which is what Scrum is designed for, because the empirical process based on organization that is that is all about addressing complex challenges and complex problems building complex products and services developing those things because complex in a way we like to see also there's a lot of uncertainties there's a lot of unpredictability hence the need for the empirical process and so on so a lot of organizations started seeing that what they have been doing making their approach to the problem. So not the problem, making their approach to the problem highly complex and very complicated, but even, even overly complicated and very complex, they started seeing, oh my God, tackling complex challenges with a complex approach is not helpful. Complexity calls for simple rules. With simple rules, you can make endless, endless combination of how to combine those rules, which is also the power, the potential of Scrum. So I, I saw that also because a lot of organizations, and now probably around 2016, 2017, started um, focusing on having great scrum masters again. Rather than hiring an external agile coach, they started focusing on helping all their own people develop into great scrum masters, good scrum masters again. Oh yeah, in a self-organizing system or a self-organizing team, a self-organizing ecosystem, uh, it, it must mean that the Scrum Master becomes obsolete, which is a strange idea because self-organization, certainly in, in a professional environment, happens within boundaries against uh, certain purpose, goals, objectives, and so on, things you want to achieve. It, it happens in complex circumstances. So not just the work that we do, the problems that we face in, 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 in terms of the work that we need to do, building great software systems or services and products, that is complex work, but it often happens in complex circumstances. Yeah? Hence the need for simplicity. People started discovering that and, and people started realizing, oh my God, self-organization requires active coaching, facilitation, teaching, helping people out, supporting people, which is exactly the Scrum Master role. Not to talk about the aspect of helping teams establish better, new, improved relationships with the organization. And, and not having Scrum Masters in place made people and organizations forget those aspects of coaching facilitation. So I saw a revived interest, first of all, in Scrum, and that was secondly much expressed by even even companies in in countries that are still work a lot in the netherlands that had went for spotify model still they started reintroducing the roles of scrum the role of scrum master i think which was a good thing and that was sort of for me i like to call i like to see that as a sort of third scrum wave so first wave of scrum initial reconnaissance getting to know scrum let's say from a sort of it it um perception or perspective mostly, then uh, turning big scale, overly complicated, giving it different names and so on. Although, although even in the second scrum wave, what people were essentially looking for is increasing their agility, flexibility, ability to respond to change, ability even to create change, ability to innovate, re-energize their workforce. It's actually all things that you can achieve by just scrum. And then afterwards, they started rediscovering that. So in the third Scrum Wave, people started recognizing the power and the potential and the value of the simplicity of Scrum. And, and that, that, I think that was really cool. So um, sometimes you have to just be patient. And I still believe that even today, Bogdan, I don't know how you see that, but I, I, I firmly believe in the, the future of Scrum. Uh, so I, I don't know what the second wave, the next wave will be about. I don't know whether it will be a, a new wave. Um, I, I, I think I think what I sense with sort of the future of Scrum is we keep improving how we do Scrum in the world of software development, in the world of complex product development. And, and I see Scrum expanding to a lot of other domains, non-software domains. Uh, so, so people in a lot of domains of society are facing complexity. And, and what I noticed, I've had it even with a couple of CXOs in the meantime, so CXO teams and even talking to a couple of CEOs, um, even here in Belgium, 
that they say, hey, God, do you know, um, we're looking into this thing called Scrum, and, and we're looking at you guys with all that background in Scrum in a software environment, in a complex product development environment, we're looking at you guys to help us out. So there's, there's, a, there's a shift happening where um, our experience of applying Scrum, employing Scrum, getting more out of Scrum in a software context, there that, there's a shift where that software context we will now use as an example for other domains of society, which, by the way, explains a little bit the third edition that I created from my Scrum a Pocket Guide. So, so in the second edition, I made it my description of Scrum slightly more generic, in that sense, less pure software specific. In, in the third edition, I've minded to keep in that software touch, that software feel in the descriptions, because I've noticed that a lot of people also in, and, and even more in non-software domains, find it useful to grasp what Scrum is about. And that's obviously because we are all software users, right? Um, also all those CIOs and CXOs and CEOs, they all use software. They have a smartphone, they have, they have to use applications, they have lots of internal products they need to use. They, they, need, they have supplies in, in that, that use software and so on. So, they, so, so keep improving Scrum in, in, let's say, where Scrum took root, the software development environment and complex product uh, development environments, and now help people in other domains of society, um, help them understand Scrum, and help them tune their Scrum to their context and so on. And all building on that same simple set of rules with the accountabilities, the separation of accountabilities, slicing work uh, into something that we call a product backlog, at least some, some, some version of backlog, and then um, learning by building, inspecting, and adapting in, in those cycles that we call sprints. So, so Scrum and Agile, have replaced the waterfall thinking in the software world. And I believe that we are also replacing that sort of predictive management approach in general. And we're replacing it with what we in Scrum call empirical management. So, so I believe in the future of Scrum. And, and the fourth Scrum, if at least one of the things that will happen is Scrum in, let's say, non-typical domains. In, and I mean non-typical not where Scrum was born and took root. Yeah, that's that's a very good point to end up. And uh, I guess Ken and Jeff are aligned with you as they have removed all the uh, notifications about uh, IT and uh, software development when it comes to the Scrum Guide, acknowledging that Scrum has yeah. been beyond IT and uh, has found wide range of applications. This is sort of danger in that too, because it seems that a lot of people now think that we can't show that we have a background in software development. So what I, I try to do in my third edition is to, to keep in that touch of software development because it resonates also with non-software developers because people are used to that. So, so I like to keep in that sort of sense of software as an example so not as this is how you should employ Scrum in a software development environment, because I think we know that by now, but more as an example to other domains. So that's sort of a, a little nuance, a little subtlety that I tried to build in the, that third edition of my, my book. Yeah. I, I guess that's perfectly fine, the same way as uh, the origins of Lean came up uh, from manufacturing in Japan and in uh, Asian countries overall, the same way we, fo we found out, okay, uh, manufacturing is something I can grasp my head around and it makes sense yep. to develop with minimum waste and with maximum efficiency. So let's use it in software yep. development. So yeah, let's hope that uh, one yep. day uh, our collective wisdom can be used for a yep. greater good. Yeah, and that's a great example to give because it, 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 it's, it's turning it, it into a metaphor or an analogy rather than the, the, the environment in which you have to apply it. Yeah. So if I had to sum up uh, what you've been saying uh, for the last couple of minutes, it feels like 
the brief history of Scrum looks similarly to the first enterprises that originated from Silicon Valley when there was a period when everyone was having fun in the garage building some cool stuff and yeah. not caring too much. Then once the big uh, players and corporate bureaucratic machine found out that you can actually uh, convert using Scrum into some US dollars, they started uh, just using it blindfoldedly as a tool without too much yeah. care. And now they are finally over the last few years started giving respect and there is uh, some dialogue happening between what Scrum can offer and can be used for against how much you can squeeze your team with Scrum. And uh, certainly here in Ukraine, it has been uh, basically a no-brainer option for when you start a new team. You just say that you do Scrum and uh, the customers or the people who are paying if it's the outsourcing uh, model in IT, if they hear that you are using Scrum, they feel more confident about your ability to deliver. Uh, but yep. people are starting to understand that this simple framework is not that simple, actually. It impacts a lot of things. It's something that I see, I, I wrote about it not, too, not a couple of years ago even, what I call the illusion of agility. So a lot of large organizations want to become more agile, so increase their agility. But they, they introduce Scrum in, can I say that, in a sort of very old-fashioned way, meaning sort of mass production, all teams in a very, very uh, short time span have to implement Scrum and, and, and start using it in a very, very enforced way. So not a lot of room for learning, experimenting, discovering it, and so on. And, and a lot of organizations introduce it in, in that sort of mass production imposed way, rather than trying to, trying to build on people's excitement and, and enthusiasm. But also a lot of companies then seem to think that, you know what, Scrum and this HR way of working or the HR way of working via Scrum, that is something for the teams. So they establish Scrum teams, so they introduce the Scrum framework with Scrum teams within existing structures. And that are often silos, uh, departments and so on. So they end up with a lot of what I call micro teams that are still quite isolated from each other. A lot of organizations think they can avoid rethinking their structures around Scrum. But you can't properly introduce Scrum without thinking to start with what is the product on which we're applying Scrum? What is the service? And how can we organize our Scrum? And how can we ask our Scrum teams to organize themselves to better serve the end product and deliver value end to end to our consumers? And that, then I'm not even talking about how um, introducing Scrum would have an impact on existing processes uh, governance, procedures, meetings, handovers, and so on. And, and, but even, even up to the level of how are we funding uh, development initiatives, but also how does, does something like HR work and the hiring process and, and rewarding people and incentivizing people. So, and a lot of organizations still need to grow through that sort of recognition, acknowledgement that, oh my God, there's more to Scrum than meets the eye in a way. Because, um, and it's, it's a message I try to bring, so be careful. A lot of organizations um, introduce Scrum blindly, also copy pasting what other organizations are doing, like just, like just blindfolded, um, just imitating what other companies are doing thinking in a way that they can avoid the hard lessons, the, the falling, getting back up, the learning as well, the, the pains you, you go through, the impediments that you need to solve within your organization. So thinking they can avoid it by quickly imitating what others are doing. And then after, and that often takes several years, end up with the, the, the finding, what I call, they find out, oh my God, this is an illusion of agility. We haven't really increased our agility. Our customer satisfaction is not improving. Our uh, workforce still keeps leaving the company. 
we are still not able to uh, hire new talented young people and so on. Customer satisfaction is still going down. Our competitive position has not been restored and so on. So, and it's what I call the deflation by reality. So they build up an illusion of agility. So they think, uh, they, they create a perception that the agility, agility is increasing, but there's at some point in time, this is what I call the deflation by reality, a hard wake up call when they wake up someday and realize, oh my God, this is not what we were hoping for. We thought we would be much further than we actually are. And, and that's, that's where I come in often with organizations to say, hey, let's then reimagine your scrum. Because like you just said, Scrum is, is, is the standard way of working. Still, I, I discovered, and I, I don't know how that is in, in your beautiful country, Ukraine, where I've been a couple of times, even done a couple of classes in the past, um, where I, I noticed in my classing, in my coaching, my consulting work, that um, Scrum is the standard way of working, yet there is so much that people can and and hopefully will discover about working with Scrum. And, and that's, so, that's so amazing because certainly in my classes, but also in my co coaching and consulting work with organizations, they often say, oh, that's right, Gunter, but what you're getting us to see, oh, that's just common sense. But the accountabilities, the roles, organizing working experience, what the events are about, that all feels to people like common sense. But I asked him, so if it's common sense, why are we not just doing it? So, so that's, that's what I love to say about Scrum and, and certainly classes and, 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 and guiding and advising organizations. It's what I, what I like to say, it's reconnecting the common to the sense. People have lost this idea of simplicity and common sense. And, and, and Scrum makes that tangible again. And, and that is something I really like. So, when I go into organizations that face that illusion of agility or wake up call in the deflation by reality, I, I suggest always so. Now you've gone through a large transformation phase, whatever. It hasn't really resulted in, in improvements that you're happy over. So let's, let's in a way make it small again. You've, you've spent lots of money, energy, training people, in, imposing practices on people. Now let's take one initiative of, of all the things you're doing that might be a important product that you're building, a service that you're delivering using Scrum. Let's, let's have a closer look at one initiative only, an important initiative, make it a meaningful one. And let's, and that's my suggestion, let's reimagine your Scrum. Let's go back to the basics. Let's think about um, how are you using the artifacts of Scrum? How have you implemented the accountabilities of Scrum? To help them look at beyond implementing Scrum within existing structures. Take some freedom and then rethink the structures around that one initiative of Scrum. So how are we going to reorganize governance, uh, procedures, working with legal, uh, quality assurance, even, even up to HR types of things for that one initiative only. And, and let's, let's start building a sort of little new organization within the organization around that one product or that one service. And, and then once we get that in place, you've grown a sort of what I call a product hub. So a hub focused on a product, which becomes an ecosystem working, uh, working on, on self-organizing teams and so on. And then, and, and then let's take the next step. Let's then take a new initiative. And, and by the time, it has taken them in the past to build that sort of illusion of agility, two, three to four years, and all the money that went into it, take the same time to rethink your structures around Scrum, reimagine your Scrum, do that iteratively, incrementally, and there's so much work you can do in the same amount of time, two to three to four years, with the same money, and with a really, a viable increase in agility, a true increase. So when you come to an organization for coaching, let's say, two questions. How can you determine that an organization is having 
a good understanding about what agility is and how do you know when you meet your counterparties, I don't know, scrum masters or agile coaches there, how do you know that a person is well understanding scrum practitioner that just just solely from talking to a person, I guess, and for organization, it should be some other markers, but uh, you tell me. Yeah, well, there's one of the things that is at, at sort of at the heart of my work and my belief, we shouldn't fall into the trap of trying to assess or audit or whatever, judge whether an organization is ready for Scrum. In a way, an organization is never ready for Scrum. And at the same time, every organization is ready for Scrum. Because it's, it's not that sort of waterfall thinking, sort of readiness and prerequisites before you start doing Scrum. No, what I look at, uh, Bogdan, is, is for me, and that's a very personal choice, uh, three criteria. First of all, when, before engaging with an organization, I want it to be based to be based upon some sort of personal relationship. So I never participate in, uh, you know, these types of things, requests for proposals or requests for offers and so on, public bids and so on, where they play out people and, and, and organizations against each other. I don't participate in those types of things. I, I want every engagement to start with some personal relationship, meaning somebody I know, somebody approaching me personally, knowing my work, whatever, wanting to work with me, or that I, I can get introduced via contact, whatever. So I, I don't do those things. That's one, one thing. Um, has it, uh, sorry, has it always been this way or you are now mature and famous enough, uh, enough to allow yourself to choose customers uh, and people you want well, to I, work I, with? Yeah, well, it's a really good question because it's indeed like, like, you, like you sensed, it's a um, situation that I've grown into. I, I'm a bit fortunate uh, with all of my experience, although that 70 years of experience also works against me often, I notice with a lot of organizations, it scares them also. And uh, it makes me also seemingly very expensive at, at, at times. Um, so I easily, easily get the label printed on my head overqualified, which is, I'm not overqualified. I'm not even, I, I, don't, I don't have some sort of maturity, I believe. I even like to look at myself, again, think in terms of openness. I like to call myself an eternal novice. I'm a novice. I'm still new to these things. I, I love it. I like to discover new things. So in that sense, I'm new to this. But, but indeed, I have grown into a certain position sometimes i don't know it was never the intention but it seems to have happened some sort of reputation but again that also works against me by the way um so i can be a little bit more picky let's say i can i can be a little more selective yeah so that's absolutely one but even i remember in all of my career those things have always been important for me so i've i've been at points very uh, very uh focused on my principles and that, that's one of my principles i believe in personal contact yeah but indeed i can i can i can look at things so and but at least so i've worked um so i worked in in consulting until 2013 then in transitional period i wrote my book scrum a pocket guide then i uh, started uh, partnering with scrub the talk and with ken schreiber uh, did that for three years from my home office in Antwerp in Belgium, working with uh, uh, Scrum to Talk, who are based in Boston. And then, and then in 2016, uh, let's say stopping the exclusive partnership with, with, with Scrum to Talk. So I also started engaging with organizations again. But that has been the sort of the light motive, the, the three criteria. So and, and again, that first criteria is, has to be personal. And it's been always working out since then. But the second criteria is again, it, I hope it doesn't come as a surprise. It has to be about Scrum. In that sense, even personal relationship, um, Scrum is my tool, it's my passion. It's, it's, it's sort of the instrument that I think, I think if there's anything where I have at least a little bit of mastery, it's going to be Scrum, nothing else. So I, 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 I want it to be about Scrum. And then the, the, third criteria, uh, the third criteria, and that's probably the most important one, uh, certainly given, given your question, is that I want it to be serious. Uh, 
So I'm, I'm not into assessing the readiness of the organization. Are you ready for Scrum? I just want to feel a sense of urgency. So, and, and that is often, I, I often ask for, let's say, I want to see evidence of that by asking um, access to the CXO or the management team. And again, I've grown into a position where uh, people don't mind me talking to management teams or CXO teams. Um, so I often ask to get some time with the CXO or, or uh, management team to have a talk with them. And that might be two, three hours. That might be sometimes even just one hour. Sometimes it's a full day. Um, often, often I don't even, uh, I don't always charge money for that just to get to, to know the people. So personal relationship has to be about Scrum. And I want to see that the company, the organization is serious about it. In that sense, that's often expressed is, can they explain what pains they are feeling? What are the pains that you are going through? What are the, the most important improvements that they are looking for? So, and, and that's always my start with those people, management teams, CXO teams, or even, even uh, often teams, middle managers. Why are we here? Why have you invited me to come here? Let's forget about Scrum for the time being. Why do you think you need Scrum? So let's not go into the technicalities of Scrum, but I want, to, I want to know your reasons. Can you express them? Are you serious enough? Because introducing Scrum and adopting Scrum is a journey in itself. It's never going to stop. There's no final state. It has no clear end state. It's going to be a journey of continuous improvement, continuous adaptation even. And, and I want to know, is it clear enough why we are doing this? because it's not going to be an easy thing. And I want to be sure that once we go through, like I've been through in my career, at least some minor, sometimes some, some bigger uh, downs followed down by ups again, I want to be sure that um, with the first sort of down situation that we end up in, that people suddenly don't give up, that you can go back to, do you remember why we are doing this? Because that helps people go through that sort of up and downs and certainly the downs. Why, do you remember why we're doing this? Yes, it's painful. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, we run into a lot of problems and a lot of challenges, but remember why we are doing this. So those are my three criteria, Bogdan, to work with organizations. Has to be personal, has to be about Scrum, and has to be serious. And when it comes to people, let's say you have to help hire, I don't know, Scrum Master from, from the market. At this exact uh, example, you don't have an option for promoting someone who's within a team and uh, capable of uh, filling in the shoes. Yeah. What are you looking in uh, people who will be coming to interviews with you? What questions will you ask them to understand during this conversation that they are proficient and knowledgeable and they have the qualities that you're seeking for? Well, I, I don't have a preset upfront created whatever um, questionnaire or, or list of questions of things that I want to check, check off. Or, uh, um, and that's sort of important because when I go to work with an organization, I want to show total openness. I will say that we're here to reimagine your Scrum. I'm here to help you rethink the structures around Scrum and in that sense, increase your agility. And I've got no upfront menu or scenario that I want to follow. The same I have with talking to Scrum masters. So, and by accident, I've recently helped out a large insurance organization um, with their hiring of Scrum masters. And, and I didn't give them anything to think about upfront. I asked them to send the, the candidates uh, CV, uh, their profile, what they've done. I looked them up on LinkedIn. I tried to grow some sort of intuition over what I think have they been doing. And then, and then I just act in the moment. So I had, a, I had a talk with the Scrum Master and at some point in time, did he make mistakes sort of against Scrum? Yes. Did he always use the right terminology? No, but I don't care. He, he, he totally got the spirit of Scrum. He was a driven guy. He was a very people-oriented person. 
which is important for the scrum master so because because you just use you introduce and you coach and facilitate the process scrum to help people develop products and services better but also to help people self-develop become better professionals become more proficient at what they're doing so when he had the drive he had the drive for excellence he had the people interest and 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 those are little things that i look for and and i the, the insurance company afterwards told me, oh my God, did you give that guy a hard time? Although I had no idea. But in the end, let's say he survived. And I think he thrived. And I think he was, he was, he was really good. So I don't have upfront things, but things I'll be looking for in a Scrum Master is uh, people orientation, an interest in people, um, a willingness to help people rather than tell them what to do help people discover solutions for themselves those are for me very very important things and another thing is in in all that hiring process of scrum master there's there's a there's a very strange contradiction and i, I don't have a solution by the way but i i remember in 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 my classes so my professional scrum classes or my custom workshops that i do with organizations and teams and 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 with public students a, a lot of a lot of the times they come to the conclusion, oh my God, come to the way we are looking at the Scrum Master role now, thanks to your guidance and, and your coaching your explanation, the cases you make us think about, this, this requires quite a strong person, strong personality. So in, 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 in that sense, I like to think in terms of, I think you you can't make yourself a scrum master or you can't hire even a scrum master i think scrum master becoming a scrum master is sort of development it's it's you develop into a scrum master you become a scrum master but often scrum masters are seen as only team coaches and then you have to explain and introduce scrum to management middle management as well because in a way that's part of the role but a lot of those people either don't do it because they're not expected to do that, or they don't have the insights or the background, or in that sense, not even the age. Sometimes it, it really helps. Having some sort of age and experience really can be really helpful. So um, that, that is a difficulty. Um, it, it, it is an enormous, for me, satisfying role. I love it but it has to connect to your personality also. And, and it's not something I think you can just turn into. It's something that you need to become, grow into. That's a very good statement. I guess, uh, I guess you're right here. Uh, maybe it's easier for people that have already done this. They have, uh, you know, they've been through some stuff and they survived and they have uh, caught this yeah. feeling of how, how to be a scrum master, what you need to do to make things work. And yeah. what, 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 I, I like, I like, I like what you just said, having survived difficult situations that makes a great scrum master. When it comes to growing up and uh, learning new things as a scrum master or scrum practitioner what would you suggest as the possible ways of uh, learning and getting better of course there are books you can read there are some trainings and classes you can take there are conferences and networking events that are out there and you can go and learn new things but what on top of it what can you do to learn in your daily work yep. nine, nine nine to five routine I, I i always i always have to think back of what i explained those my first seven years of scrum just doing scrum working with teams different teams um sometimes stubbornly trying to stick to whatever you're doing uh figure it out uh, one thing that has certainly helped me as a scrum master a lot is to learn to take it to the team. So I, I've, I've had, I remember very difficult times for me as a person, as an individual, as a scrum master, 
feeling like I'm not fitting in with the team. I'm not really connecting with the team. I don't know, it's so difficult. They're doing all that great stuff and solving problems and so on. And, and other challenges that I went through, and, and, and I can be a really, really emotional person. I can be really emotional over that. And what has helped me time after time after time again is to take it to the team. At the retrospective, guys, I want to share something. I really feel sad. I feel bad for this. I see this happening. I don't feel... And, then, and, and every time together with the team, we figured it out. And, and, and often the team helped me relax again and feel a little bit more secure or certain again over myself. Um, so, so seven years of doing scrum with several teams, that's one thing. I, I, I noticed that a lot of people don't have that patience anymore. Now, it wasn't something I planned, right? It's not like in 2003, I decided for myself, cool, I'm going to do seven years of scrum and then I'll be able to whatever. It doesn't work like that. I had no ambitions. I just loved working with teams. Um, I remember in 2007, somebody from my team pointing out to me, and that was sort of a revelation to myself. He said, Gunther, do you know why I like working with you? Because in a way, you've got this, this ambition of sort of 360 degrees satisfaction. You want to have a happy customer, you want to have a satisfied customer, you want to work with users, but you also want to have a happy, satisfied stakeholders, and, and you want to have engaged teams that love to come to work. And, and I said, working with you is sort of, you're a pretty restless person, but you will never stop until you've got all those things in place and, and, and sort of 360 degree satisfaction. And that was sort of a revelation for me why I had never considered that. And I felt, yeah, that, that, that's me. It doesn't make life easier. But that is one of the things. But seven years of just doing Scrum, people, people want to grow into positions too quickly. I'm often saying, take your time. It's okay. It will, it will, there will be opportunities. Keep that openness for options and opportunities and then grab them try something else, sometimes stick to what you try to do, although it's not working out, don't give up too quickly, sometimes abandon what you're doing, do something else, do that way of thinking. But in those seven years, taking it to the team has been a very crucial thing. So if, if there's one advice, Bogdan, I could ask, or I could give to Scrum Masters for their development as a Scrum Master and, and growing mastery over scrum is don't forget to take it to the team if you have doubts if you're in doubts if you don't know what to do take it to the team they will help you out uh, the way we educate our our kids and children how we make them grow up and, and even when they go to university when they go to work when they try to climb the ladder it seems like we're very um, focused on telling them to to, to be brave and to be bold and never never show emotions and you have to be rational all the time. You have to be strong. You can't show any doubts and so on. And I think, no, no, it's exactly the opposite. Show vulnerability. It will help you. Vulnerability is a force. It's a power. It's a strength. It's not a weakness. So, and so that is important because that's, that's sort of opening up to the team. Take it to, to the team means be a little bit vulnerable. That's okay. We are human beings. Because that's something, if, if you think about sort of the, the future of Scrum, um, and another aspect, so first of all, Scrum beyond software and product development, but also using Scrum to truly what I call humanize the workplace. And that's part of it, opening up to people, showing I'm a human being too. I've got my weaknesses. I've got, I've got my faults, I've got my flaws, I've got my problems. Don't try to hide them. Show them, show them to people, work with them. It will create a better, um, healthier relationship with them. And, and it will help us humanize the workplace. And that's for me, one important aspect of Scrum. So, so the process, the empiricism of Scrum, the empirical process, 
we are using that to replace old school waterfall approaches, linear thinking, sequential approaches, and even predictive management. We're replacing that with empirical management. So that, that process aspect of Scrum, that is really, that is really coming true. People are getting it. But the people aspect of Scrum, that's, that's again for me a huge challenge um, to help people see, organizations see, yeah, but you know what, self-organization is a quite powerful thing, but probably a very difficult thing to implement. It, it, it has to do with people, human beings, people, not resources. So, and, and that's when, when you think about it, um, that vulnerability, that different relationship that you just shared an example as a product owner, I shared some examples as a scrum master, that, that is part of humanizing the workplace, being able to show that we are human beings, that we have a private life, that we have, uh, that we might have a happy personal life, or maybe we're going through difficult times at, at home or, or with family or whatever. And that's all part of us. We, we take that to our workplaces. So tolerance, diversity, and, and humanizing the workplace so that people come back to their workplace re-engaged. And engagement across the world with the workforce is, is incredibly low. So a lot of people don't like to come to work. And I believe with Scrum, based on uh, self-organization, we've got the tools in Scrum to give people the sense of being in control over their work again. Because in, in Scrum, control doesn't come from breathing down people's neck all day long, um, watching over them, uh, seeing whether they're doing uh, their work as, as they should and whether they live up to the silly example, their estimates or whatever. No, no. Control in Scrum is, is what is already, it's not really control. So that what is already described in that old paper that was, that we know, the new, new product development game in 1986. Those two Japanese professors that for the first time launched the idea of Scrum, a very team-oriented uh, way of working in, in, in product development. Um, so, and they already described that um, the role of management is to support those teams, to provide funding, um, to give them moral support, to give them financial support, and to give them feedback to manage from the outset. So manage from the boundaries. So leave things alone and then check in with them at the sprint review. That is, that is how you work as a manager in Scrum. And that in itself already gives people control over their daily work again. And, and it's, it's team oriented. So I believe humanizing the workplace is a very important, it's, it's my core theme. So when I left Scrum to talk back in 2016, I started calling myself an independent Scrum caretaker because I care for Scrum, but Caretaker also, for me, um, has this notion of caring for people. And like my old friend back in 2007 pointed out, you're, you're all about people. You want to have happy customers, happy stakeholders, okay, budget under control and, and progress under control and happy teams or engaged teams. So it's all about people. So independent Scrum Caretaker. And, and I see myself as on a journey of, of humanizing the workplace with Scrum helping people see that Scrum is not just a better process with, with better results or better outcome or better output, but you can also introduce Scrum in a way that it re-engages people, inspires people again, gives people energy again. And those two aspects, building better products or, or doing better work with Scrum and, and more engaged people, they reinforce each other. It's not the one or the other. And, and I feel currently that after 20, 25 years of Scrum, the focus is too much, we're out of balance. The focus is too much on the process part of Scrum. Not on the and, behavior? And not, not on people, not on behavior, not on interactions of people, not on how people within a Scrum team, but also beyond the Scrum team, how people in a system, in a world of Scrum, interact and collaborate with each other. So that people aspect, that is, that is, I think, increasingly important. And, and that will be, that's for me at least a very important focus for the, my future book of Scrum. And it's really fascinating that if you think about it in Scrum, the 
control, which is really not control, but sense of things being under control comes from trust, where you know that people are capable of doing things that they are about to do within the given constraints and boundaries, which is, if you think about it, quite a paradoxical thing where control comes from trust. Uh, and I would also almost completely agree with the about the uh, sharing vulnerabilities as being a very powerful thing with one condition that the environment you are expressing yourself in is safe enough and not hostile and it might be mm -hmm. easier to do when you have worked with people for some time and you know them but maybe harder to do for a person that is new or for a relationship that is just forming. So if you end up in the wrong company or in a company that is driven by some corporate great values and they don't give a damn about people by uh, expressing yourself, you may hurt yourself yeah. even more, but ultimately you will realize sooner than later that uh, it's not a good place for you to be around for too long. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that, that safety of the environment, uh, it, it, there's, there's again a sort of contradiction in the word. Because in, in, in a scrum world, a safe environment actually means what you just described, an environment where you can show your vulnerability, where you can also express your opinions um, safely, in that sense, without being bashed, without your head being chopped off. Um, so that as a team you figure it out, you figure out options, possibilities, contradictions, um, contradiction, contradicting options, uh, different opinions of, of stubborn people within the team. So safety or safe environment indeed in Scrum means an environment where people feel free to speak up. And, and that's in a, in a traditional environment that is not, that's not seen as safe. Safe means hiding, speaking, silent, that sort of uh, silence in a team room or whatever, that is not safety. That looks like a safe, uh, uh, an environment where feel, people feel well, but that's not truly safety. Yeah, absolutely. So again, if you think about the Scrum Master or what we talked about earlier, take it to the team and be a, be a living example of what a safe environment is. To help people see it's okay to speak about those things and and then guide them coach them in that guide them in having open conversations constructive conversations and and help them figure out their natural conflicts because that's part of complexity you will have conflicting opinions and conflicting conflicting viewpoints um, help them constructively solve their conflicts which is a safe environment where you can constructive can have a conflict but are able to constructively solve it rather than holding back not speaking up not voicing your opinion that is not safety that's that's even the opposite yeah we have 10 minutes left and i would like to focus that time on your book about 97 things every scrum practitioner should know I've read it all through just, you know, to have a proper conversation with you about it because uh, okay. we have cool. arranged the podcast a couple of months uh, in advance. And that, friend, that, that is, by the way, a lot of reading because it's, it's, it's quite a, those 97 things. That's quite a lot of reading, I believe. Yeah, yeah exactly. And I found the trick. Uh, I've read it uh, mostly in the evenings when I put my little kid to bed. He has uh, <laughs> 10 minutes for a uh, last bedtime story that he watches uh, a cartoon okay. normally. And this is enough for me to pick up on one or two chapters from the book. So that is uh, okay. how I made it through. And a couple of questions, if you don't mind answering them in a brief way so that we can cover it all in a few minutes that are remaining. So why did you decide to go for this structure with many separate and incohesive stories rather than one cohesive piece that you can easily digest and consume like your pocket guide it's like i don't know 
two hours of reading if you are focused and are fluent with English. And here, it took some time, as you pointed out. Yeah, but the reason is simple because this is um, 69 offers. This is not one offer. Um, that, that explains so the, the concept of, of, of O'Reilly, the publisher of, of, of those, it's a series of book, 97 things every something should know. Um, so the concept is to, to, uh, to collect 97 articles about a topic. Now, um, I've tried to work on, on cohesion in the sense that, um, so I've collected those articles. I have ordered them and I've grouped them into a number of themes. So I've grouped them in, in the themes like, like, you know, the parts. So the part one, start, adopt, repeat, part two, products deliver value and so on, part three. So I had about eight, nine, up to 10 um, articles for every topic or theme. And, and so for me, there is cohesion. In that sense, I've tried to group them into themes and, and if, even in a way, order them, have them in a sequence, so that if you would read the book from beginning to end, where this is easily a book where you can browse and pick on a story and, and look at the title that you like. But, but my ambition actually was to create a, some sort of flow even across those 97 articles. So, so I've, I've combined them because they're around a certain theme. And I've, I've tried to make sure that still there's some sort of flow going through the book. Because in the end, I, I decided it might not it might not come across. By the way, that that, that is fine too. But I, I've seen books in the series um, that are just one one long list of ninety seven articles, without any grouping, whatever. Just um, even even more disconnected than this might seem. So uh, so my ambition was to order them, group them, and still create some flow through them. Yeah, but uh, for me, it was reading one article and then trying to, you know, reflect on what I just read and uh, what I can yeah. get out of it. And then I read the second article and it can be a roller coaster when the first one is extremely interesting and I'm turning the page expecting, okay, I want this guy to write more. Uh, and the next one is like, okay, this is not interesting at all. I should move on. So. Yeah. Okay. At some point for me, it was like, okay, I, I give up. That's enough reading for me today. Yeah. Because no, normally when you read the book, you are having a growing interest about what the events will, the turn of events will be. And here it's more, you need to really digest them one by one was my conclusion. And I just read last chapter one day, uh, one story, and, and that was it. So I have time to... Uh, think about what I read to reflect because otherwise despite being grouped in some uh, yeah. logical categories they get yeah. mixed up really easily but uh, yeah. it's it's also it's also a way of of showing respect also for the work of those authors um, so I was not the author of the book I've got a couple of articles in but I was sort of what I call the editor of the book so I collected them I ordered them I, I made suggestions to all of the authors for edits and, and changes and so on but that's it every that was for me extremely important to make sure that every article in a sense was still recognizable for the author himself or herself that yeah this is my article so the, the ambition was not to take over. And, and that, that it's, so what you just described is sort of a natural result of, of the concept, I believe. But it's in a way good that you bring it up because it, it's a struggle that they've been going to because I'm working on a new book of Scrum because I've got my Scrum pocket guide. And, and I've noticed that in the, in the 10 years that I was sort of writing seriously about Scrum since starting since 2010. So 2010 until last year, 2020, or at least a decade of writing, and, and even today, a decade of writings about Scrum, there's a lot of stuff that never made it into my other book or even this book and so on. And I just go, oh my God, I've got a lot of things. So I've been going through them and doing sort of the same like what I did for the 97 Things book, but then for my own articles. And then, and then I, I totally got into what you just described the challenge of making it a cohesive book. 
and 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 that, that's obviously the ambition certainly given the the still enormous positive feedback i get on my 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 pocket guide to have a book of the same quality and cohesion again so and that's what i discovered oh my god writing a new book about school my, my third book then is going to is 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 turning into an enormous effort again if i want to sort of get the same excellence that i i, I think i hope my, my pocket guard had and exactly for the reason that you described it's it's now i've got i've got lots of things ready it's it's sort of in a way almost ready but it feels too much like individual articles so i'm going to have to put a lot of work in it to make it a cohesive book again but as as there's now the third edition of my pocket guard so in a way i've bought myself some time to uh more time to work on it so i i hope to have a, a new book about scrum ready somewhere in the course of uh 2021 are you planning on making another 97 wisdom stories book with uh, no no the, the suggestion hasn't been made yet and certainly the publisher hasn't asked for it i thought about it when even when i was in the process of creating this book uh, what about a sort of 97 things more 97 things or 97 more things that every scrum practitioner should know um i don't know whether i would be up for it because i spent by the end of 2019 so so i established the contact with the the publisher by the end of august 2019 i was taking a sort of break from consulting i was sort of temporarily fed up with consulting and, and, and working with large organizations again. So I had to so sort of refuel. Um, and, 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 and by accident, I got in touch with O'Reilly and I spent whole three, four months until the end of 2019 working on the book. So I spent an enormous amount of energy on it. Luckily, those uh, articles came in gradually, piece by piece, so I could work on it. And then in, in, in a way, it turned into an iterative incremental process again. But I spent a lot of time on it. So I, 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 I wouldn't know. I haven't been asked uh, to do another one. I, 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 honestly, I wouldn't know whether I would do it again. But currently, the book has been translated into Japanese, imagine. It, it's going to be published. So we're now March 2021. The, the book is out in Japanese. It's being translated into Polish, I believe. This probably a couple of more languages coming up so luckily luckily the book isn't end of life yet so uh i don't know if ever comes the question as i i as i am bad at saying no i would probably say yes Bogdan. but let's 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 keep that silent let's not <laughs> are there 97 more people in the world that you would ask for an article yeah, you know what I think with this book, I think a lot of people that didn't contribute in, in the first book that I did ask, or an, an, a number of people that I didn't ask to contribute, probably are now willing to contribute. So in that sense, maybe I'm a bit naive, but in that sense, it might be easier to get people willing to contribute an article. But again, you never know. Yeah, I mean, I would definitely that how no matter how naive it might sound, but most of the people who are working with Scrum and Agile for, I don't know, five plus years at least and have been doing it seriously can come up with, with some sort of wisdom or unique experience because everyone has unique experience and everyone has many. And, and this is the thing that I found reflected in many articles they're very niche so they work for it's like a person you, you feel you know the person who's writing the article because you've been in the very same organization you have faced the very same type of problem and the the wisdom that is being shared is some of uh, something that you have previously experienced it, it's your pain as well and maybe for yep. this very reason some articles didn't resonate with me at all because I, I haven't been there and for me it's just 
I don't know, uh, like, you know, a snowman or Yeti or whatever. I've just heard <laughs> stories of it and I never encountered yeah. it in real life. So it must be uh, just a work of imagination. Maybe this is the reason. But uh, Maybe, who knows, and maybe someday you will run into a situation and then think back of the book. Oh my God, I think I've sometimes I read about it and maybe you can look it up and maybe it might still be helpful. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. If you have any events or things or announcements to make, this is your chance to do it. Uh, what's on your radar? Is there anything uh, coming? Maybe some participation in uh, online conferences or any different events that you would like to share? No, my, 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 what I would love to share with your listeners, Bogdan, is that I, it, I'm, I'm sort of feeling very excited. I recently did uh, two what I call pilot sessions of a new workshop that I'm, uh, I'm developing. Um, it's, it's a workshop that is focused on the Scrum values. So it's called the value in the Scrum values. So it's based on a blog note I wrote about the Scrum values. So a, a very short focused workshop about three hours in which I take a group of people in, in general, like up to 15 people through a, what I call an interactive discovery of the value in the Scrum values. So looking at the Scrum framework, not through the perspective or through the, the lens of, of the roles and the artifacts and the events, but through the lens of the Scrum values. So um, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm going to, I'm going to shortly start uh, planning sessions for that. Uh, response after the two pilot sessions was really great. The pilot session was for a limited uh, audience, let's say. Um, also helped me see what I should improve, what I should change, where I should extend things a little bit more. So uh, the next step is, is launching it for the general public. So I'm starting to plan classes. So uh, if anybody wants to look at Scrum to the lens of the Scrum values, please have a look at uh, my workshop and attending my workshop. It's a three hours thing. Um, I, I, I also noticed that a lot of people appreciate it because certainly in the COVID times that we're living in, it's also a way to have a short break from the daily rat race and spending all your time in meetings on Zoom or other uh, video tools. Yeah. So, so keep an eye on, on it's on my, my website, by the way. My website is just myname.com, so gunterverheijen.com. Um, there's no view of training. So something I'm particularly excited, a little bit stressed and nervous over too, but I really believe that it's part of my future, humanizing the workplace, looking at Scrum to the lens of the Scrum values. And it's uh, an online course that you can, uh, yep. an online workshop that you can attend from every corner of the world and yep. in English. Yeah, absolutely. It's in English indeed. It's online. Uh, it's, it's highly interactive, but it is indeed online. So uh, I, in general, plan it in, in my afternoons. Um, that means in, in Belgium. That means I've, I, in my pilot sessions, I had pe I've had people from the US where it's early in the morning by then up to um, sort of in, in Asia where it's sort of later uh, in the evening. So that uh, I'm, I'm a lucky guy to be at, at the heart of the time zones, let's say. Um, cool? Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, it was a very pleasant conversation as, as for the first conversation with another person. Uh, but nowadays it's becoming, I guess, an emergent trend that uh, when our communication is quite limited, uh, mm -hmm. we try to, you know, take take the most out of it and we shred everything that uh, the psychologist can describe in the book so we get straight to the point because mm -hmm. we value our time way more uh, you've mentioned this red race which is i guess the case for many people listening to us uh, i hope it blows off uh, soon enough but uh, we have to see yeah, absolutely. So uh, thank you again, Bogdan, for having me on your podcast. Uh, I, I, I look forward to, uh, to you sharing this with your listeners. Mm -hmm.